This is week three of a voyage into history. We are sailing a replica of the Endeavour, the ship in which Captain Cook discovered the east coast of Australia in 1770. He had embarked on an extraordinary three-year voyage of exploration that took him into the largely uncharted seas of the South Pacific. We're attempting to follow part of Cook's exact course in the Southern Oceans, trying to gain a deeper understanding of both him, his crew, and what motivated them on their epic voyage into the unknown. We are a British, American, Australian and New Zealand crew and include professional sailors, scientists, medics and historians. I am here as part of the crew, but also to record the adventure. For the last three weeks, we've been sailing up the treacherous Great Barrier Reef of Australia. And it's been tough. Sickness and injury have taken a toll. We've already lost two of our history professors. Ian here had to leave with a bad back. And then Andrew collapsed with pneumonia. We took him to a deserted island to be picked up by the flying doctor service. Well, it seems like we're down to three historians. They're rapidly becoming their own subject matter. History. They're running out, falling, falling over one after each other. I don't know what on earth is going on down there, unless there's some conspiracy and all knocking each other off to be the last historian left on the endeavour. We are now preparing to leave Australia once and for all and head west across the Arafura and Timor Seas to our destination, Jakarta. We have in front of us an epic 2,000 mile voyage across open sea, again in the wake of James Cook. Right now, we're in the Torres Straits between Papua New Guinea and northern Queensland, an area once thought to have been a land bridge until Captain Cook proved otherwise. We made our preparations to sail. The wind got up from the southwest and was accompanied with a swell from the same quarter. This left me with no room to doubt that we were westward of the northern extremity of New Holland and had now an open sea to the westward, which gave me no small satisfaction. Not only because we might now escape the dangers and fatigues of the voyage to this point, but by also being able to prove that New Holland and New Guinea are two separate lands, which until this day has been a doubtful point with geographers. Now at last, our navigators have been given the reins of the ship. And it's sure it's For the last two weeks, they've been practicing the complex techniques of 18th century navigation. This is serious business, this is not playing. And uh, I have never navigated a boat of any sort before without a chart. Um, I've navigated a lot of different ships, a lot of different boats in a lot of different places on the world. But uh, I've always had a much better idea of where I was and where I was going. This is very, very different. Bye bye Australia. On our way to Jakarta. Four weeks of this. Much better than pulling up anchors. We're about to stretch our wings because now there's no more reefs. It'll be excellent sailing. This is what it's all about. There's perfect wind, perfect wind, 20 knots, and we're going to get everything up, and there's just an open ocean in front of us. That's it, full of food. <laughs> Everybody is looking forward to constant supplies of fresh fish, the bounty of open ocean sailing. Mickey, from the Royal Navy, is one of the first to get his line in the water. All right, is yours away? Yeah, mine's in. And Cyril follows suit. Using the same bait as Mickey, Cyril? Uh, yeah, i got to be honest with you, I really have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> I just uh, was helping Mickey untangle it. Don't know the first thing about fishing. Uh, but so far, it's going very well. <laughs> You're probably the first one to catch them. <laughs> exactly. I'm waiting for the line to go ripping through my hand and have to scream for help. Fortunately, however, Al is here who actually knows something about fishing. Mickey, do you know anything about fishing? Tar. Not a thing. Mate. 
To get from A to B, we'll only be using the very limited and inaccurate charts that Captain Cook had at his disposal, or at least our navigators will. Whether or not we reach our destination is now up to them. So guys, is this a bit of a challenge? <laughs> is it a challenge? <laughs> yep. It's yes. in some ways. It's a challenge in more ways than one. In some ways, I think it's probably more of a challenge. Yeah. Uh, let me not get this out of context. Um, Cook was a pioneer. And I think in its way that Cook's trip, totally into the unknown, had a lot more to be admired about it. It was a lot more difficult and a lot more bold than the Apollo program to put men on the moon. He had no communications with the base. The, the Royal Navy would have loved to have supported him if they could, but once he left Plymouth, he was on his own, completely on his own, totally on his own resources. Whereas uh, Armstrong, Aldrin, and the one everybody forgets, Collins, were in continual contact with Houston the whole time. They went where reconnaissance had already been carried out. Cook came out here absolutely blind. They didn't know what was here. Everybody knew what to expect on the moon within reason. So the guys who went off in the Apollo program, yes, pretty damn brave and very impressive. Cook, he kept a crew and a ship and a scientific research program and an exploration program all humming, all working for two years. What a star. And so we follow Cook into the wide open ocean, powered by nothing more than variable tropical winds and our own muscle. The first thing to do is unfurl all the sails we have to catch all the wind that we can. Suddenly, one of the fishing reels screams as something bites the bait. The line is pulled with such speed that whatever's on the other end has to be enormous. From the top of the mainmast, we see a veritable sea monster. Tom, what is it? What is it? It's a, a manta ray, which is, it look, looks, you know, well, Trevor reckons seven or eight feet, but it, I, I don't know, it might even be bigger than that. It's absolutely huge. It looks like it's taken the line. Um, Not around that, up. No, no, there's no way. I don't know what the braking strain is on that, but uh, they're better off just to cut the line and get rid of it. The gigantic ray, completely oblivious of the fishing line it snagged, swims off into the wide open sea roughly in the direction we're going, and actually more or less at our own current speed. In fact, knowing our direction and speed at all times is absolutely essential. It's one of the ways we, like Cook, can keep tabs on where we are. It's called dead reckoning. Now, direction is easy to monitor by the compass, but speed is more of a problem. Cook measured his speed by a technique called streaming the log something our navigators are going to attempt. We've got, we got this thing lashed down, all right? We are throwing something out behind um, a piece of wood, that's where the log name comes from, and letting it run out on a spindle. And the idea is it stays put in the water and we sail away from it, so that we count the number of knots in the string that run out in 28 seconds worth of sand. And the number of knots that run out in 28 seconds is our speed in knots, and that's where the word knots comes from. Okay. So five, four, three, two, one, bingo. There's one gone. No, no, hang on, hang on. Don't. Still quite a way to go. No, that's right. I'll give you a countdown as best I can with this sandblast. OK, all right, fine. <laughs> what fun. This is very good, Peter. Three, two, one, stop. Stop. No, it wasn't bad. Okay. Right. Uh, yeah, we got to bring it around the side, I reckon. I go straight up. Is that Al? That's a cobia. Good eating. <laughs> really good eating. This is getting better and better. You want me to? I'm going to bring them over here. You can pull them right over the side. Okay. Can I get this in quick? It's bouncing around in the most unpleasant way, and I'm going to lose it if I don't get it in soon. Just let go. Just let go. So just let go, and I'll wind it in. 
It's gone. It's gone. It's gone away. Oh, oh, no. Is that what he did? He bent the lure off? Yeah. No, he snapped the fucking piano I can already taste it. That's huge. On Cook's ship, the men were often fishing too. Joseph Banks, the principal botanist on board, was as excited as anyone about the prospect of fresh fish. Dolphin all around the ship today. And shark have been seen. Two were sighted this morning, and one eventually caught when it attacked tomorrow's meat being dragged in the water to freshen. Then, a large fish was taken with a towing line, baited with a piece of pork rind cut like a swallow's tail. Four, five, six, seven, oh dear. We've got the line again. Eight. I'm interpreting oh, it myself. I wouldn't do that. Who? It, it digs in and, and sort of tries to pull me over. You can't stop this boat and come back for you. Know? I do realise that. <laughs> Shut up. No, we launched, <laughs> launched the piggy. <laughs> launched the what's it. Your sense of humour will be the death of me. <laughs> All right, that's two knots. Some are navigating. Some are fishing. Some are sailing or tending to ship's chores. And some are still learning the ropes. I think I just did this completely wrong. Come on, Mel. Eyes on you now. Melissa from the States is receiving guidance in deck work from some of the voluntary crew, especially Mickey of the Royal Navy. Can you nip after and get one of the chickens to show Melissa how to put this on? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's termed in the naval circles as a bunch of bastards. Is that, is that, is that right? No, 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 no. Come here, out of the way. Mm. Not for me again oh, to do it for yeah, you. Yeah, what have you done? I know how to do it. <laughs> oh, thanks, Mickey. Is this, is this you, the dumb American? <laughs> the dumb blob American? I can't do that. Gee, that's too hard. That's exactly what I did with it. No. You got it underneath. You should be like that. OK, well, that's about a few feet. It's got two knots on. A few feet beyond the two-knot mark. There's the two-knot mark. Which either means two knots or four knots. Well, that was what... That was the conundrum that Duke said. <laughs> <laughs> See, look! She's picking on me! <laughs> She's only human. She can't keep her hands up. Bless her. Oh, fish. Big fish. Big one. Oh, that was seriously big. That was huge. That was about three feet long. Look at the wave, look at the wave. It's a marlin. And he's not on, but he's there. I think they're toying with you, mate. Bastard. He's still there, isn't he? Well, well what, have, what have we proved there, then? <laughs> we, pro we proved it works. We proved it works. It okay. works. It works up to point. It works up to point, and uh, we know how to use it. We don't know how to interpret these markings, but Dougal says that's them doable. On. Though we can, yeah, we can look that up. them on in a particular way. We can look and, that up. Um, it doesn't seem to be the same way that we were expecting quite. But I mean, that's like I think the other thing I get out of it is that it is it is quite clearly a craft, a craft which ordinary men had, and presumably were taught by somebody. Yes, which we haven't got. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Oh, like so, such a lot of things about yeah. the uh, about the journey. I mean, just this business of estimating speed. You can estimate speed in your own boat, can't you? Like yes. I can estimate yes. speed in, in the boats that I sail regularly. Well, I haven't found it too difficult on board this boat. Wouldn't you allow for the fact that we're three times Supper. Not the baked fresh fish we'd all dreamed of, but the usual, salt meat and boiled vegetables. The same food that we've eaten now for nearly three weeks. After supper and before sleep, one more ploy to catch a fish.
Al's a fishing pimp, and I'm one of his bitches because he's got me catching squid so he can catch bigger fish. We need something live at night because at night the fish don't see well, so they all hunt by smell. We need a nice, smelly, stinky squid. And then all the ones after that we can eat. We just need one for day. Yeah, I heard a big talk about normal? all the fish we'd be catching. It's all good. It's all good. They're yeah. with a wheelbarrow. He's not rushing these things. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's a bit I've limp wristed. Seen, I've seen too good at this movement, doesn't I? <laughs> yeah, you got the limp wrist thing down pat. That's uh, the distance covered is about usual. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I've had enough of this. <laughs> oh, I'm wrapping my claw in. No, nothing there. Empty as a hermit's address book. As another day at sea begins, the navigators, as usual, monitor the progress of the sun over the sky. The sun is vital to our way of telling the time. You see, we have no modern clocks on board. Now, Like Cook, we calculate our time by reference to the sun. When the sun is at its highest, we know that's our midday, called ship's apparent time. And actually, this is the start of our day, or at least the start of the way we tell the time every day. Sand clocks measure the hours from this point. And bells are sounded every half hour. So half past 12 is one bell, one o'clock is two bells, and so on until the end of the four hour watch, which is eight bells. Then it starts all over again for the next watch. For Cook, this was as accurate as it got. We're not used to working on the bell system. We're sort of getting people used to it, We're getting ourselves used to it, because people forget to turn the half-hour glass, and, you know, then the half-hour glass isn't quite accurate, and we expect it all to be pinpoint accurate nowadays, because we have a sort of fetish for um, horological accuracy. We expect to know the time to every second, whereas, of course, they didn't. They just worked on the basis of three bells, it's a bit after breakfast, you know, in the forenoon watch. They always knew what watch it was. Uh, you know, whether it's the forenoon watch or the afternoon watch or whatever. And uh, you just got a vague idea of time. And a um, whole different concept of time and ways of living and ways of behaving that w than we have. And it's quite difficult to uninvent the 19th and 20th centuries, you know. <laughs> we're sort of, we're just used to it. People say to me, what's the time? And I say, I don't know, it's somewhere between three and four bells. And they say, but don't, I mean, what does that mean? But time was also vital for telling Cook where he was on the Earth's surface. He didn't have satellite navigational systems, precise maps, or atomic clocks accurate to the millisecond. But what he did have were the heavens, themselves a sort of celestial chronometer. Establishing his latitude, where he was north or south of the equator, was straightforward enough. He just had to measure the angle of the sun with the horizon when it was at its highest point, in other words, at midday. But finding his longitude, where he was east or west, was much, much more complicated. To do this, he had to know the time where he was, easy enough by observing the sun, but then he had to compare it with the time back at base, that's in Greenwich, London. The difference between these times would translate directly into distance. For example, on the equator, a difference of four hours would represent a distance of some 4,200 miles. But without an accurate chronometer that could maintain Greenwich time at sea, watches were simply not accurate enough and pendulum clocks were useless on a rolling ocean, Cook used what's called the lunar distance method of navigation. This enabled him to establish the time at Greenwich from anywhere in the world and was a cutting edge development which Cook and his astronomer, Charles Green, were pioneering. By this point in the 18th century, astronomers in Greenwich, London, could work out exactly where the sun, the moon, the planets and the stars would be at any time of the day or night and the angles between them from the point of view of planet Earth. These calculations, which could be made into the future, were published in a complex book of tables. 
All times, of course, were given according to Greenwich time. Cook and Green carried these tables on the endeavour. So when they took their own measurements of the distance and angles between the moon and any other heavenly body, they could compare their findings against the predictions in the tables and thus establish the time in Greenwich. Because they knew their own time by reference to the sun, they could calculate their own longitude from Greenwich. But the whole calculation involved some diabolical mathematics and would take hours to work out. We've got a little tiny new moon over here, brand new, new and shiny, and uh, it's quite unobtrusive, and we're just at sunset, and we're waiting to see Mars, which should appear about at that angle, and we need three measurements. We need the altitude of the moon, we need the angular distance between the moon and Mars, and we need the altitude of Mars as well. And the trouble with this is that the horizon will become very unclear once the light is gone. You get a very blurry horizon, you can't get a good altitude, so even if you then get a good lunar distance between the Moon and Mars, you can't actually make the equations come out. So it's all a bit delicate. We're standing here with lots of sextants and a torch and um, eyes fixed on the Moon, hoping the boat doesn't swing around and obscure it, because what I hadn't realised about square riggers when we came on this trip was how many sails there are that get in the way. We need really a series of, if we can get it, seven observations, so that we can graph them and see which ones look anomalous and which ones look accurate. And then, while well, still isn't out, and then uh, start to take the best one and calculate it out, which will take two of us working side by side about two to three hours, I suppose. A midshipman was introduced to this method just before Captain Cook and his voyage, and he said the observations are quite straightforward, which indeed they should be on a good night. But the calculations are very perplexed, you say, which is a lovely way of putting it. Is it there? Where is it? OK. With the help of last night's lunar distance readings, our navigators are trying to find the south coast of New Guinea as a landmark to Indonesia. Specifically, they're trying to locate False Cape. This is vital for us because from here they will know to turn west and follow our planned route. If they miss it, we'll just keep heading north, right off course, and get totally lost. And remember, the trouble is our navigators, like Cook, only have old, distorted, and inaccurate maps. Indeed, the latest position they've plotted, according to these maps, puts the ship half a mile inland on top of a mountain. I think that is probably a fairly reasonable latitude and longitude. And so it demonstrates that Papua New Guinea isn't really there at all. But we know that it exists, and so the only possible explanation is that it must be further north. That's the only possible explanation. No, it's here. It's definitely in this area somewhere. We haven't gone north of it, so we're still south of it. Sure. I think we have to take a worst case assumption here and assume that we're rapidly approaching uh, this false cape here. Mm. So we would like to turn north mm. or even east of north, find yeah. the coast yes. and then turn left again and follow yes. the coast along. And we must find it and know that we found it before we reach the cape. Um, at the end here, because otherwise we're in, as you said before, in empty ocean for uh, another two or three days. So, that's what we're doing. Actually, we'd better get this place clean, because it's get cleaning it. stuff clean in a minute, doesn't it? Absolutely. Tidy, tidy all our things away. So, who's on watch now? I am. Right. Whether we are on course or not, the ship has to be continually cleaned and maintained. Water barrels especially need regular scrubbing to guard against the formation of algae. Does it smell nice enough? I smell it. Does it smell nice enough? Oh, my God, it's disgusting. No. It's not in there. No, it's not. It's relative. It's all relative. All right, there's some nice slime right there that I can Good get. Good girl. Oh. See, Cook had someone to do this, especially on these voyages, I expect. And then we got you. The navigators also have to maintain their equipment so they can continually plot the course they've taken. Right now, they're worried about the spacing of the knots on the log line that gives them their speed and the accuracy of their sand clocks. Because we've got hourglasses here that are giving 
25 seconds instead of the regulation 28 seconds or 30 seconds, what we've got to do is reconfigure the log so that it reflects that timing and the speed of the ship. And if you look in some of the treatises on seamanship there are and some of the documents there are about logs, everybody has a different opinion of how the spacing of the logs, of the knots on the log line rather, should be. Some say 45 feet, some say 48 feet. Uh, that document says 50 feet. Captain Cook, I think, liked 48 or 47 feet and was fiddling about with the distance on the log line when he got to Cape Horn. So after two months at sea, he still wasn't content that the log line was doing a job accurately. For some time past, I've generally found the ship by lunar observation to be northward of what would be expected from our reckoning. This is not owing to a current, as I first imagined, but to a wrong division of the log line of two and a half feet on each knot. This has since been rectified. It'll work for us if we have the knots on the log line separated by not 45 feet, not 47 feet, not 50 feet, but 42 and a half feet, um, which is uh, one of those nice convenient numbers which, um, uh, look, it's a pragmatic business. We want this log to work because in daylight, I can look over the side of the boat and say we're doing four knots or we're doing five knots or we're doing six knots, and I'll probably get it right. I can't tell the difference between 4.4 knots and 4.6 knots or 4.7 knots, and I would really like to know whether the ship is doing, you know, which fraction of a knot the ship is uh, achieving. And the more precise we can make the log, the easier it will be for us to get our uh, dead reckoning right. So what with one thing or another, we, they, we, it keeps us busy, it keeps us busy, it keeps us out of mischief. Don't move it! I won't. Pick here, you're getting Melissa to scrub your barrel. Oh, <laughs> you know, if we were to if we were to turn this if we were to turn this oh. upright right now. <laughs> you alright in there? Should we put this lid on? Okay. <laughs> it's turn in the barrel. I, it's Moises' turn. <laughs> this is turn Moises in the day in the barrel. <laughs> Let's get this pull, pull that peg out. Get the peg out. Wait, she's in upside down. I can't be trusted at all. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. It's filthy in there. 1,000, 3,000, stop. Oh, got it. Okay, and... You okay pulling it in, yeah? I wish this thing would stop pulling me, trying to pull me over. No, it's all right. There are all sorts of stories about people going overboard with these things. It digs in, doesn't it? It does, indeed. Especially on the port side. That's what I'd like to do. I just don't want to go something without asking. Another bite, and once more it's a monster. A barracuda that could feed the whole crew. What we caught earlier, it's an old trail. <laughs> huh? yep. We'll never be able to reel it in. Once again, the line won't be strong enough. This requires a whole different approach. Give us one of these lines, quick. Oh, I got a tail rope for you, hang on. Quick rope. Alright, man. Alright. Everybody, when this fish comes up, be careful, because he'll shred you. Look at Tigger. Look your hand, Tigger. Pull him up. Pull him up a bit more. A bit more, Mario. You need to go Where's that no? 
knife. Watch it get out of the way. Watch oh, my. Where's that knife? Watch his foot. Watch your feet, Mario. Hey, hey, hey. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was Fresh wicked, boy. man. Jesus. <laughs> Hold him like this. Take, awesome, take grab. Isn't it? Our immediate thought is that the log line has pulled one of the navigators overboard. Start getting this boat ready! Master off and get this boat ready! David, our astronomer, is frantically trying to point out to sea. Dom, right top of the main. Hey, on the floor Where up? Six, six, six. What's overboard, Dave? Just the log. It just jerked up and out of here. No, not a man at all. But I've got to keep my eyes on it. I've lost it now. Uh, it's in that direction, though. I've lost it, Captain. We lost the log overboard, and we sent the rubber duck to go and try and find it. We've drifted quite a far down since then, and it's not very easy to see, so now it's a little bit like looking for a needle in a haystack. We have another log on board, um, and it would be good to recover this, but uh, it's not the end of the world. Well, what, the next one, we'll have to actually have retaining clips on the um, basin that holds it to make absolutely certain that it can't jump. Furthermore, I think it's not really a two-man job to do this, it's a three-man job. Uh, certainly not a one-man job. Uh, you know, that's, um, that's just a, a, a bitter lesson from experience, isn't it? First, the academics are trying to get off, and now the equipment's trying to escape. We're going to get to Jakarta like the Marie Celeste, there'll be no bugger on board. <laughs> the bad news is the log line sank without trace. The good news, the fish are now queuing up to get on board. Mahi Mahi, Spanish mackerel, and tuna. Nice fish. Woohoo! Nice, nice fish. <laughs> 12 days of salt beef, French tuna, Parmesan <laughs> cheese, capers. I thought tuna comes in tins. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in brine or with. Yeah, tomato sauce, you want it? <laughs> It's getting a bit bloodlusty around here. Look at the I don't think either of them are in that category. <laughs> Apparently, Al, Al, Al likes, makes the sport of eating the heart. So I was anxious to try something new. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It can't hurt. But you can still feel it going like this as it goes down. Good, 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 good. Jumping off your good, tongue. Good. <laughs> For Cook, it was probably about the same as it is for us, which is the fishing and the collecting of you know new food just gets everybody really excited. It does wonders for morale. I mean, the whole quarter deck is buzzing as soon as a fish comes up for half a day, you know? And you just got a big smile on your face. Look what I just got, you know? I just pulled this out of the ocean. I just got, got way out of touch with the civilized grocery shop and nature of man and got in touch with the wild, you know, hunter-gatherer um, that I think I am. Wow. Yeah. I think we're going to have a nice tea. In spite of all the excitement over fish, John the Navigator gives the order to swing the lead. That is, heave a weighted rope into the sea to measure the depth, currently 13 fathoms, about 26 metres. He wants to see whether we're getting shallower, a possible sign that we're nearing land, nearing New Guinea. Let's wait. Why the sudden panic about depth? Because we're getting close. Well, we're not that close if it's 26... Um, if it's 13 We don't pounds. know, do we? we, we no, we don't There's know. a change in the wave pattern. Yeah. yeah. We're getting reflected swell off the shore from somewhere. And it's, it's a lighter-coloured sea. 
So I, I reckon the visibility is about seven or eight miles. The captain reckons it's less. Yeah, I reckon we're near land. Where are those clouds? I reckon we're near land. Well, we must be near land just for those clouds. Those clouds only really form over land. Well, we're going to cook the fresh fish that was caught this morning. A little bit of garlic, a bit of salt and peppers on there, and we're going to put it into the oven now and see what happens. So you have to keep the fire banked up and right up against the oven to keep it hot, nice and bright. A lot of heat there. Well, this will go down well with the, with the troops. Oh, yes, a change from salt beef. I'll be popular <laughs> today. <laughs> <laughs> Eight fathoms! When you consider that uh, we're sweating blood to sound in eight fathoms, and Cook used to use a 200 fathom line, I don't, he doesn't say how many people he put on it, but I hope he had a bit of a gang because uh, this is quite hard work. Our soundings are getting shallower. There's a ribbon of cloud on the horizon and the colour of the sea is changing from blue to green. All the indications are that land is near. Hold on tight, John. Of course. John is convinced we should soon be able to see New Guinea. I believe it's in sight that way, over to starboard. It looked as though it might be visible. So I'm going to step out on the yard here and uh, hook on. So I can get a good look around the corner. We continued bearing to the northward, having very irregular and uncertain soundings from 24 to 7 fathom. By the mark, 7. At four o'clock, we made out the land from the masthead, bearing northwest by north, which appeared to be very low. This is definitely a brown smudge running from just forward of the starboard beam back to just aft of the starboard beam. That's it, and then it disappears again. So that's the cape we're looking for, false cape. But I have absolutely no doubt that's what it is. And this is something I have always wanted to do. Do you want to stick your fingers in your ears for a moment? Yeah. Deck there! Land ho! And it's genuine too. The navigation worked. We found it. And uh, it's a great relief, I must say. Great pleasure. I wish my wife were here with me <laughs> to see it. But I don't think she'd enjoy it up here. But I wish my grandson were here with me to see it. He'd love it. Love it, I love it. Saw it come, saw it come on board. It looks good, it smells good. I know it's gonna taste good. You notice how quiet it is? Yeah. It's a They're sure just, sign. They're just eating. They're just eating, yeah. <laughs> How's it taste now? How do you think? <laughs> We've just got to break in here now, then we'll get the two favourite parts, the fish eyes and the brains. There we go. I think I'll stick to the veggies. This is the gem. Fish, fresh caught from the ocean, on the plate in half an hour. One of the more succulent tastes of Captain Cook's ship that we're now acquainted with. So, is this making the idea of being an 18th century sailor more appealing? No. Absolutely no way, no, no how. No, I like my creature comforts too much. 
Did you like the sense of adventure? Oh, yeah, the sense of adventure, yeah. Blooming hell. But it's nice when you can do it on a warship with uh, the instant power, instant hot water, um, nice food, usually. Um, no, I, I don't think I would have liked to be an 18th century sailor whatsoever. Spent all your life at sea, literally. Was it Cook's first trip was three years or something like that? No, not for me. But there can be something incredibly peaceful about life at sea, whatever ship you're on. And right now, for us, life is actually pretty good. The navigation is working, they're well on course, and we're at last feasting on something fresh and not salted. Also, it's now September, the beginning of summer in the Southern Hemisphere. Sorry to wake you up so alarmingly. You are actually sitting, probably sitting, on the most safest place in the world right now. What I'm going to tell you now is going to shock all of you. This morning, American time, 8.30, a 737 was flown into one of the Twin Towers at the World Trade Center in New York. It was full of passengers. It was hijacked. It was an internal flight. 20 minutes later, another airplane flew into the other Twin Tower. That one was hijacked as well. About two hours later, an airplane flew into the Pentagon, full of passengers, another hijacked. And a fourth airplane was crashed in Pittsburgh, with undisclosed number of people dead. Shortly after the one in New York, the Twin Towers collapsed. Here, believe it or not, we are safe. Obviously, the Americans, first of all, would like to contact their people in America and talk to them, and reassure them. And then anybody else who wishes to talk to anybody, if you have any relations or friends in America, and if you want to talk to them, then you can use a satellite telephone, which is down in the great cabin. Other than that, we'll continue with our normal routine and keep on trucking, because there's nothing we can do. We have the minimum of details, and only our imaginations to depend on. One thing we can be sure of, the world we will be returning to, is going to be a very different place to the one we left behind just three weeks ago. question two days ago whether I'd like living in being an 18th century sailor and I said no. I think I kind of like to be one now. I feel helpless. Um, I feel Um, I don't know, I, do, I mean, I feel remote from it, but not removed from it. I feel like if I were at home, at least, at least I would be at home, you know. I'm trapped on a small boat with a bunch of strangers for all intents and purposes, and, um, you know, in a, in a time of need, one likes to be around loved ones and, and you know, at least be on familiar ground. I almost wish that we couldn't get any news at all here. I almost wish that we never got it and got it in Indonesia, because this is almost worse than if, if we could get nothing at all. But it's such an exciting, terrible thing that happened that it just builds on itself as we're sitting around, and it's worse than if we actually had the news. I'm 
I mean, I work in an environment of 24-hour uh, news coverage, and information being key and prominent in our lives. Cook's original crew, they were at sea three years at a time, and think about the significant changes that went on while they were gone. I mean, here we are, literally, um, we will, will have been out a total of five to six weeks, and our world has changed dramatically in such a short period of time. Imagine for them, start to finish a three-year period, and being and returning, and so much of their lives having to take that back, take their lives back, so to speak, and recapture everything that will have transpired for those 36 months. That's unimaginable. Unimaginable. In fact, after more than two years at sea, Cook and his men did get news of home from a Dutch ship which had English newspapers aboard. Themselves, of course, at least six months old. We learned that the government in England was in the utmost disorder. The people crying up and down the streets, down with King George. That the Russians had sent 20 warships and a large army by land to besiege Constantinople. And that the Americans had refused to pay taxes of any kind, in consequence of which was a large force being sent there, both of sea and land. Next week, dealing with the terrible news from home as best we can, we continue our voyage across the wide ocean, heading towards a tropical island paradise visited by Cook in 1770. But nature steps in and does her best to stop us from ever arriving. <laughs>